over at bangthebook.com. We are your one-stop shop for sports betting news and information. As the prop catalogs get released from the offshore sports books, we'll talk a lot about those over the next 10 days or so here in advance of the Super Bowl. We'll have a lot of NFL content coming your way next week. But in the meantime, we've got lots of stuff in college basketball, the NBA, daily NHL when that returns, all the NHL now on the All-Star break. Uh, so we'll have a lot more NHL coming your way next week. Situational betting articles, got a UFC preview up for this weekend. NASCAR is not that far away. Great golf event this weekend at Torrey Pines. We got James Mazzola's preview of that. Always something going on over at bangabook.com. So head on over there. Make sure that you check it all, check it all out. Finally, as you know, this and every edition of Bang the Book Radio, presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook. BTB and the number 200 is that promo code. 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook. 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino at BetDSI. It's only a game until you bet it. A couple guests on the program here today, and we start with professional handicapper Brad Powers from BradPowersSports.com. Brad, how's it going today, brother? Man, it's going well. How are you doing on this fine Thursday? Very well, buddy. Appreciate your time as always here, sir. Thank you so much for joining me. And, uh, well, I guess let's go ahead and talk about Super Bowl 54 here, unless you've got a game of the year on the Pro Bowl that you want to talk about first. <laughs> no, I do not have that. So uh, no, no Pro Bowl talk for me. Although, I mean, there has been since they changed the rules up a little bit, a little bit more value on the under in recent years. But uh, certainly no big play for me on that one, buddy. I won't even watch it. Yeah, neither will I. All right, so let's talk Super Bowl 54 here again. The 49ers and the Chiefs, if you don't know that by now, I don't know where you've been for the last five days, but we've got Kansas City here, the smallest of favorites at most places, a one-point favorite, a little bit of extra juice on the Kansas City side in the offshore market. Of course, the publicly tuned shops, Bovada and my bookie, one and a half with juice or minus two. I imagine the split looks pretty similar out there, Brad, between the books that cater to a little bit more sharp action and some of the more square books that are out there in Vegas. Yeah. I mean, it looks like most are dealing, you know, one in 54. That's pretty much consensus. You know, a couple of the square books are, you know, are dealing 54 and a half on the total. That seems to be probably the squarest pick of the Super Bowl, at least so far in the first four or five days of betting, uh, they, you know, a lot of money on the over, whether it be sh- sharper money real early and then, the pros are, are going to want to bet scoring after both the AFC and NFC championship games go over the total. But it, it's been pretty consistent, and uh, I'll be perfectly frank with you, in the next you know seven to ten days, I I don't expect to see too much line movement other than maybe we'll see that the, the total continue to creep up a little bit. But, uh, you know, looking at it here, as my cat yells at me. I was going to say, who, this, who does the cat like in the game? Uh, he didn't like me talking about the total. I mean, maybe he likes the over. Jeez. Uh, <laughs> looking at it here, I, I don't expect to see too much line movement. I'd be intrigued to, to think what you uh, think uh, on that. Yeah, I don't really see a whole lot of line movement either. The, the one thing that's kind of interesting to me, you know, I grabbed Kansas City to pick them early on in the process at minus 110. Figured that line would go up a little bit. Kind of wanted that position so I could see what I wanted to do with the game. The more I kind of sit here and think about this, and I know we had a little bit of an initial move towards the Kansas City side, it almost feels to me like San Francisco will be a little bit of the sharper pick in this game. I think there will be two-way action both ways, but I think San Francisco may end up being a little bit of a sharper side. you agree with that? I do, Uh, or at least... It'll be interesting to see because I think a lot of the old school guys that are, are going to look at, you know, how do teams do with the better defense in the Super Bowl? Very strong for, for, for the teams with the better defense. How do teams do with the better run game in the Super Bowl? Very good for the te- teams with the better run game. And certainly San Francisco checks uh, the box on each of those. So, yeah, from what I'm gathering so far, I, I do think San Francisco will probably end up being the sharper of the two sides. But Let's not beat around the bush. The, the sharpest thing to do with Super Bowl uh, betting is prop betting. That's going to be where I think, you know, at least the guy, not necessarily the betting syndicates because you can't get, uh, you know, $500,000 down on a Super Bowl prop, but the, the guys that do it professionally that are betting 1000 2000 5000 10000 a game, they're going to attack the props more than anything, more than at least more than the cider total. 
Yeah, I mean, again, you know, this is the biggest game of the NFL season, as we all know. I mean, there's not much value in a line like this. There, there just generally isn't. It's going to be one of the sharpest numbers of the year, not just from the open, but also with the influx of money on a game like this. That shapes the market, and, and that really puts it in a position where, you know, as you said, I don't think this line moves very much at all. I, I think maybe there's an outside chance, as you kind of read between the lines a little bit, that perhaps you get San Francisco minus one at some point if that becomes a sharp enough side. I don't see Kansas City going up that much higher because they even went up to one and a half and two, and it came back down a little bit. So the books kind of know that they probably don't need to go up on Kansas City I think at this point, it's only one way moving on San Francisco if we get anything on the side. And it's South Florida. I mean, it's going to rain at some point, whether it rains during the game or it rains before <laughs> the game. We don't know, but it's going to rain. So the total probably does come back down a little bit, even though a lot of public money will be on the over. But if, if you're sitting here waiting for a price on this game, waiting for something on the side, something on the total, you're probably not going to get it. No, I just don't think you are. So, I mean, you you can, you know, do with that with what what you please. And obviously, we're not anywhere near key numbers here. So, it's not like you're you're missing out too much, uh, you know, if you're waiting or whatnot. So, yeah, I I, I think both teams – the number is fair for me. Now, I'll go back to – you originally bet Kansas City a pick. So did I. I I actually did – you know, took the AFC – over the NSC and pick them at that point. But, you know, it, it really depends. I mean, a couple of factors, you know, that, that, you know, need or at least questions that need to be answered is I think I'll say this. I think the number one factor and whatever your answer is would probably go a long way in who you're going to bet is Jimmy G. I mean, I think there is a major question mark on him. I'm not saying that he's below average. I'm not even saying he's average. In fact, generally speaking, I think he's an above average quarterback, maybe good quarterback but the fact of the matter is for me I mean limited playoff experience and hasn't been asked to do too much and if it's a close game and he's got to go score for score with Patrick Mahomes who we do have answers on in his relatively short career already in the playoffs I mean however you think Jimmy G's going to fare in that scenario uh, is probably to me the number one factor of who you're going to bet in this game Yeah, I mean, that's the big thing, you know, and and as we sort of start to transition over to the prop side of things a little bit, I know we might be a little bit touch and go with your segment next week because of some prior commitments that you have. But that's the thing. As you start looking at game flow for this, you know, Kansas City is probably going to adopt a very similar game plan to what they did against Tennessee. Nine man box, single high safety, let your corners play on an island, force the quarterback to beat you. Does Kyle Shanahan in the two weeks of prep time figure out the weaknesses of that chief's defensive scheme of flooding the box of playing single high safety. Does he let Jimmy G try to throw this thing early on in the game? If he doesn't, we're talking about Garoppolo having eight pass attempts against green Bay, the bye week you know, now he's in the biggest game of his life. How sharp can he be? You know, does Shanahan. This game. If he does, does that soften up the Kansas City defense? If he doesn't, what happens if this is close? So from a prop standpoint, this may be the hardest Super Bowl that we've had because Kansas City's got all these flashy, high-flying skill yeah. position guys. Does San Francisco run 75 plays in this game to Kansas City's you know, 45 or 50? Can you take overs at that point in time? I think it's going to be really tough to try and ascertain what the game flow is here. Excellent point uh, on your behalf. And what's been a little bit easier in the prop market, the, you know, in the last several Super Bowls is you've had so m- many data points when you're analyzing how New England ha- handles a Super Bowl. That's been the beauty of having the Patriots in each and every year. You got an idea of how to price it. And, and you know, we don't know how, how these guys are going to necessarily get coach in this game. Andy Reid and or uh, Kyle uh, Shanahan in this instance. And maybe – I'm going way back here. I'm going to date myself. But maybe it's a very similar game plan since offensively you look at the numbers at least coming in in the postseason into the Super Bowl, very similar. I'm guessing maybe that they do something San Francisco, like what the Giants did to the Bills way back when, uh, controlling the clock. I mean, the best defense against Kansas City is just keeping them off the field, period. Maybe we see something like that where the Giants had a time of possession of like 41 to 19 in that game. 
I could easily see that being the case. And if Kansas City is only going to be on the field for, like you mentioned, 45 plays, it's going to be awfully tough to, to cash a lot of you know, prop, individual prop plays for them, even though that they've been super explosive. So I agree with you. Player props, I, I'm just, I don't think personally, I mean, it all depends on what prices are, but I don't see myself having as many Super Bowl player props as what I've had in the past. I'll probably go more, more game specific. You know, for second half outscore, first half type of stuff. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's probably the way I'll look at it, too. Also, look at a lot of individual defensive player overs, particularly on the Kansas City side, because if San Francisco controls the clock here in this game, mm, does run smart. a lot of plays, you know, the safeties, guys like Sorensen are going to have a lot of tackles. Uh, the corners are going to have to help in the run game. You know, linebackers are going to get lots of tackle opportunities. And that is something I've had great success with in previous Super Bowls is looking at some of those tackle over props, some of the sack over props, stuff like that. And the thing that's really interesting about this game is I think both of these offensive lines are very, very good. So Kansas City may be able to play something of a ball control offense without the running game because Mahomes may just be protected. And as we know, he can evade the rush. San Francisco with that great four-man pressure, do they get there? And if they don't get there, how does the back seven hold up? So th this is a challenge, man. It, it really truly is. And you know, you've got two contrasting styles. You kind of wonder which one of those is going to win out. And also you've got two exceptional head coaches here. I love Kyle Shanahan. Everybody knows that. Andy Reid, while he doesn't have a Super Bowl, I mean, the guy's been very, very successful. We know how well prepared he is off of extra prep time with that bye week here. Tough game, tough game, tough handicap, tough prop handicap. Got to be real, real smart with this year's selection of bets. <laughs> yeah, you do. And, and be careful, uh, you know, obviously when you're lining up, because I think there is some variance here to, to which one will weigh out. You always got to be careful the old bankroll and lining up, you know, four or five bets. If one happens to go wrong, <laughs> it usually makes those other four or five bets, you know, negative EV. So this is the type of Super Bowl where I'm not necessarily lining up a lot of things because I, I really, I mean, I'm not saying you can't have a strong, you know, opinion on whether it be San Francisco or KC. I just, to me, it, I just don't see it. And I don't see, you know, a lot of public bias on, on either of the two where you can, you know, be a true cont a contrarian here and line up against the public. Just not seeing it. One thing I, I do want to highlight what you said uh, with the tackles and individual defensive players, public wants to bet uh, offense, obviously, when it comes to individual player props, quarterbacks to start off with and probably wide receivers next and running backs. Uh, they don't necessarily attack, a, you know, defensive players. And I think that'd be a really smart thing to do. So tip of the cap to you. Well, and again, I mean, think about it. You know, how does Kansas City win this game? Well, Mahomes has got to be really good. You know, they're not going to run the football. So Mahomes has to be efficient, probably throw for a lot of yards, probably not get sacked a whole lot. And then also you have to isolate, is it Watkins? Like it was in the AFC Championship game. Yep. Is it Kelsey? Is it Tyreek Hill? Is it Damian Williams as a receiver? Which I think is something that I'm going to take a very long look at, in particular with that San Francisco pass rush. Williams is kind of that safety valve, that quick dump off guy. You start to look at something like that. If San Francisco is going to win this game, how much of it is because of Jimmy G? You know, they could win this game and Garoppolo could have an awful stat line or at the, you know, or at a minimum, a very low volume stat line. But everyone's going to look at guys like Mostert. So maybe it's Matt Breda. Maybe it's Tevin Coleman if he's able to play. Maybe it's you know, something different, some fullback runs, some fullback screens, crazy stuff that Shanahan likes to throw out there. You know, you got to think of this creatively, too. Y you do. Uh, w w what's tough is both teams are so versatile and, and on both offenses that and there really isn't a, a significant go-to guy. I would say this, I mean, just from past experience with so much reliance on the quarterback, I, I have to think, I mean, I, kudos to San Francisco and just run, line up and run like they did against Green Bay. Uh, you know, if they can win a Super Bowl like that, I'll, I'll certainly, again, tip the cap to them. We just haven't seen a Super Bowl one like that, to, you know, too often. I know Brady didn't have a great, you know, statistical Super Bowl a year ago, and it was very defensive-oriented. But, I mean, when, pretty much since the, the Brad Johnson, Trent Dilfer-type Super Bowls in the early part of this century, I mean, it usually takes – uh, a pretty good effort out of your quarterback that, to get over the top here. And when you got Patrick Mahomes on the other side, 
I, I, I have to think when it's all said and done, Jimmy G's going to be a little bit more uh, used to trade more than six out of eight like he was in, in the NFC Championship game. At least I'll say this here as we transition over to college basketball that this is probably the best matchup we could have gotten. You know, I mean, I, I guess you could certainly say Baltimore, but you know, it'd be a, a run fest both ways, probably, you know, Lamar Jackson evading the rush. Again, it would still be a very good game, but from a watchability standpoint, from an intrigue standpoint, these two teams do things so differently. The contrast of styles, I think, makes for a really, really good Super Bowl, and, and God knows it can't be worse than last year's game. <laughs> I didn't mind last year's game, so uh, because I, you know, I was I had a lot of like Todd Gurley under, and I, I like the Patriots, and I, I didn't mind it. So I, I know people like offense and whatnot, but I totally agree with you. I mean, this is to me one of the more intriguing Super Bowl matchups uh, we've had at least in, in recent memory. And I, I, I'll I'll throw this out to you, but I wouldn't be a bit surprised that this is something we we, we see maybe another time or two at least. I mean, because you got the best, in my opinion, young coach in the game in Shanahan, uh, and obviously you got the best quarterback in, in the league, hopefully for the next 10 years, and, and Patrick Mahomes. So wouldn't be a bit surprised we see this matchup uh, another time or two. Yeah, that would definitely be interesting. And, and something else that's interesting here, and, and this will be the last point we make here, actually, it's something I just thought about, something I talked about yesterday on the show a little bit. I know that you've mentioned before, you know, some of the soft numbers that have been out there in New Jersey – and obviously, Kansas City is probably going to be minus three in Iowa. San Francisco might be a slight <laughs> favorite up in Reno, stuff like that. But with legalization, you know, really across the country now, and there's what, I think 20 states or something open for betting here on this, and some that are hoping to actually be open for betting on the Super Bowl by the time this game rolls around. I mean, this is the first, you know, large scale uh, U.S. betting Super Bowl. You know, last year we had New Jersey, we had. Pennsylvania and West Virginia and you know, a couple of other states here and there. But this year we got a lot of them and that's going to be interesting to see too. It's going to be interesting to see how the envelope gets pushed from a prop standpoint in some of these states, what changes may be adopted in Nevada for prop betting, what they're able to do and get approval for the different lines that are out there in different states. That's an interesting little side note to this game too, that, I hope gets a lot of national coverage, and a lot of national run in the lead up to the game. Excellent point. And, you know, the, some more articles are coming out uh, on how some of these individual states ha have handled the, the, this football season so far. And I got to be honest with you, Adam, I, I don't know. <laughs> I got to start questioning myself. What am I doing here uh, in the state of Nevada? I still think it's, you know, if you want to be a, a sports better, I still think it's the best option. Jersey's, you know, obviously gaining momentum big time in, in that. But when, when I see, uh, like, I was reading an article that in the state of Oregon for the Oregon-Auburn game, which was basically Auburn right around a field goal favorite, they were dealing at some points prior to kick kickoff, Oregon minus three, minus four-ish. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously you got the money, you can, you know, travel around. It would be really interesting if we get to, like, 35, 40 states with legalization, I mean, it might be in your best interest. You want to do this professionally, just to you know, rent, get a car, uh, hopefully with good gas mileage, drive around and get the best of the numbers that way. Yeah, there, there's definitely going to be a lot of opportunities, especially if you live in a place that's got a lot of border states. You know, for me here in Ohio, Michigan's on the move. Indiana's already got it. Kentucky's not that far away. I mean, I don't know how Kentucky doesn't have it already with all the horse racing that they have. Pennsylvania's got it. West Virginia's got it. Yeah, if you're able to just kind of be uh, almost like a betting nomad and just sort of rack up a bunch of miles on a car, maybe you do get the opportunity, uh, you know, at times to really take advantage of some of the numbers that are out there. And again, we will see some discrepancies. And just imagine what this thing would look like one of these years if the Giants or the Jets are in the Super Bowl. You know, <laughs> if you've got one coast with one thing. You've got the other coast with another thing. That would be really fascinating, to say the least. Yeah, I mean, because California looks like they're, they're nearing here probably sometime this year or next year. And to have like a 49ers, uh, you know, Jets type of thing. I mean, obviously, the, the, the chances of that happening are slim to none. But still, to, to have that East Coast, West Coast that dynamic with legalized, legalized states, I got to think you see some discrepancies of two, three points, uh, differences. And, and to be honest with you, 
in a game like the Super Bowl, that, that would be where the value is at. If you're looking to bet side or total, again, I still say the true value in this market is in the props. But even then, I mean, shopping around, I mean, you can get differences in passing yards of 10, 15, 20 yards. Obviously, a, a tremendous amount of value there as well. Yeah, I mean, even even the Steelers or the Eagles. You know, if the Eagles got there back go. to the Super yep. Bowl, you know, something like that. I mean, it, it would be just – and again, I mean, as, as somebody who, you know, studies and follows this industry very closely with, you know, the line of work that I'm in, it is something that does interest me quite a bit to see these price discrepancies. And, and like you said, the prop discrepancies, even, you know, occasional chances at middles with some of these things, you may have a 20 yard middle on passing yards prop or something like you that. You still even get that here in the state of Nevada, even after yeah. we've been around for all that, you still get that. I mean, it gets gobbled up pretty quickly, but you still get that to this day. Right. Yeah. And, and again, I mean, don't, that's the way to attack this, you know, try to find plus EV bets because I can tell you that it's hard to call the side in total for the Super Bowl a plus EV position because that line are uh, just absolutely the sharpest of the season here, to say the least. Like I said, hopefully we can get Brad back on the show again next week. I know he's got a lot of stuff going on. We'll try to get another segment with him, get some of those prop bets out there that we've actually played uh, out there for our listeners on the show. But we transition over to college basketball for a few minutes here, and, uh, you know, it's it's business as usual. You know, we got uh, things kind of changing, the narrative being changed a little bit in the Big Ten with some more away teams actually getting to the window here this week. But overall, it's just kind of, you know, the, the regular grueling process of betting college basketball and handicapping 50, 60, up to 140 games a day. <laughs> yeah, and if you're wondering – been back in Big Ten home teams all year, and you've been cashing. You wondered what the hell happened the last couple of nights backing those home teams. You could thank me for it because I just had to go out there on Twitter and tweet out how strong the Big Ten home teams have been. And, and the reason I did is, you know, if you looked at the last ten games, and again I tweeted this out on Tuesday prior to, to everything that's happened the last couple of nights, it was just as strong the last ten games as it was the the first forty games of the trend backing Big Ten home teams in conference play. But obviously, that's completely changed. So you can thank old Brad Powers for, for tweeting that out. I guess he wanted to get some more uh, hate thrown his way on Twitter, I guess. Uh, maybe someday he'll learn his lesson on that regard. But you mentioned it. I, I mean, I, it's no different than any other. I mean, sport, it's a grind. I mean, you can't overreact to the wins. You can't overreact to the losses, especially when you, you got to do it uh, on a night-in and night-out basis and you're dealing with 40, 50 games a night. So... Never get too high, never get too low. I mean, same as usual. Yeah, pretty much. And and again, I mean, that Big Ten thing, you know, w when there's some sort of massive outlier like that, the, the books adjust. And when it's a major conference like the Big Ten, they're going to start adding a little bit more home court advantage into the line. They're going to start kind of shading things a little bit. And also, I mean, look, it was probably an unsustainable trend because the Big Ten's got a lot of good teams. Eventually, road teams are just going to perform better. So, if you do catch on something, and, and Kyle Hunter's talked about this a lot on our Monday segments, if you've got a team that is not covering against a team that's covering a lot, the team it's not covering tends to do pretty well in those matchups because, again, that line winds up getting a little bit inflated. You get regression to the mean, stuff like that. You want to try to pay attention to as much of that as you can in college basketball. You do. Now, I'm going to push back a little bit. I hadn't really, I didn't think you were paying much of a premium on these Big Ten home teams. At least that, that's not what I saw that even into this week. So I, I didn't think it was a major premium, like you're paying an extra point or so. And, and to me, some of it made sense why the home teams were winning at, at an historic rate because you mentioned, hey, there's a lot of good teams, but I looked at it a different way. Hey, there's no great team, and great teams can go on the road in conference play and get a road win. Where, I mean, if you looked at the difference between the second best team in the Big Ten and maybe the 11th or 12th best team, what's that power ratings difference this year? Three, four points. So I think with a lot of good teams and a lot of uh, parity in that league and no, nobody great, no one was really able to overcome that. Now, that's changed a little bit, obviously, in the last couple of nights. But to me, the trend, at least for this season, at least at the start, made some sense to me. And I didn't see much of a premium. And, and I don't think you're paying huge premiums in college basketball until about starting this weekend is when you start are going to pay some premiums. Why? Because there's no football to bet anymore. And all those people have been betting football for the last four or five months. Trans finally are starting to transition over into basketball. 
No, that's an excellent point. And I guess I'll go ahead and pat myself on the back for a second here before we talk about this weekend some more. I, one of the things I mentioned last, or in my situational article over at bangthebook.com is really low major conferences. When these teams step up and play their chief competition, you know, the teams that they may be fighting for that auto berth for the NCAA tournament with, it's a big game for them. Those are spots those teams really get up for. Look at Hartford last night. Yeah, and we're going very, very under the radar here in the America East, but Hartford played Vermont and then plays Albany this weekend, two of the better teams in that conference. In between, they played UMBC. Not a team that you're going to get up for, not a team that you're going to get excited about. They were laying three and a half or four points at home in that game and lost by nine. So situational betting, still very important. And in particular, if you're somebody who, you know, hasn't been paying too much attention to college basketball yet because you've been doing college football and all that. Look for these situational spots, man. That they they're not always going to win, but they're good starting points for a handicap. And when they do come through, it it certainly feels really, really good. Yeah, I get it should when you're talking American East basketball. I mean, folks, ladies and gentlemen, you gotta put your hands together. He's talking Super Bowl, he's talking Super Bowl props. He's already working on his major league baseball guide. And he's diving into the American East basketball on a nightly basis. And he's hosting a daily radio show. And, and he's married. He's got a new house. Uh, I, I just, I mean, I'm, forget tipping the cap. I mean, I start genuflecting at this point. Well, thank you for that. You can't see me blushing, but I promise you that I am. <laughs> All right. So this weekend, you know, you, you kind of touched on it a little bit there before I uh, hijacked the segment to pat myself on the back and, and hurt one of my rotator cuffs. But. You know, you said this weekend, I mean, look, it's just the Pro Bowl. You know, college football is done, long gone. NFL, still a week away from the Super Bowl. What do you think is, is going to be one of your big takeaways here from this weekend? I think that this will be, the, like I just briefly mentioned, this will be the time where you maybe pay a premium. Uh, when you get a very, I would say, I mean, I don't know if ignorance is the right word here. But, yeah, I mean, I'll say ignorant, you know, betting market as far as the, the public jumping in here. And I think there's going to be a, a game where I think there's going to be one side this week. It doesn't mean it's going to uh, win or not, but I am going to fade it. I think Baylor at Florida will be one of the squarest picks of the entire year, that being on the, the new number one team, Baylor. So what will happen is, very generically speaking, this very – you know, public people that, that have been following it are going to see a number one Baylor team laying a extremely short number against an unranked Florida team. And I got to think they're going to think that's got to be so easy. Baylor minus one, one and a half, two against a team that's not even ranked. I got the number one team in the country. That's easy. Give me Baylor. And I, I just think that's going to be one of the biggest square picks uh, of the entire season because people haven't been following it. And they're going to see, and it already fits the narrative that, that I like to bet on, you know, whenever you have that unranked team, you know, a short number or the fact that they're favored over a ranked team, I usually think there's value on the unranked team. To me, I think it sets up perfectly with it being, uh, you know, the, the primetime ESPN game and whatnot. I'm going to be on the Gators. I'll fade the number one team in the country. Florida beats Baylor outright. Yeah, I like that. And again, you know, a lot of people getting into the market here, as, as I've talked about a few times on previous shows, they want to bet teams that they feel are trustworthy, the teams with a number next to their name, their ranked teams, you know, those blue bloods that they feel like are good year in and year out. Some of those teams aren't that good this year. We talked about that on last week's segment. This week, I think you do see a lot of that. I think you see a lot of public money on the ranked teams and spots where maybe they don't deserve it, on the big name teams that aren't playing very well for, you know, any number of reasons. People are just going to play them because, oh, I know that name. I yeah. remember that team. They were really good last year. Well, yeah, maybe they lost, you know, 60% of their scoring from last year. Maybe that's why they're not very good this year. I think this weekend is definitely going to be one of those weekends where you do get some of that inflation from an ill-informed betting public. Yeah, and, and then I think it only gets worse from, from this point forward because, I mean, only one football game left, and then people just starting in February, building up to the crescendo, which is March Madness, this is when you start paying premium, at least on public teams. So, and, and you know, people are going to jump in. Ooh, Kansas. Uh, and, and they're, you know, <laughs> they're not going to think, oh, they got three suspended players. So Kansas's number will probably be a couple points shorter than what it should be. 
uh, and people are going to look to, to bet the Jayhawks this weekend, for example, because they know Kansas and they know Kansas has been pretty good this year. And, you know, they can't remember, but they've been in the news here recently. So I'm not saying you can't win playing on those teams. Just know fully well that you're going to start paying a premium from this point forward. Brad Powers, professional handicapper over at bradpowersports.com. If you're a VIP client, well, you're probably going to see a Florida play here this week. And if you're not, well, you got a free play from him in that Baylor versus Florida game. But what else is happening over at the website right now, man? That's an excellent throw. And that's why, I mean, you're just only getting better as a professional broadcaster. So uh, what else is happening? Uh, I'll just briefly mention it. Uh, football newsletter for next year, 79 bucks. It's an early bird price. NFL college. It's 55% for the last five years combined in college football and the NFL. 79 bucks early bird price. If you're looking for college hoops, daily updates, 199 through the championship. Go to bradpowersports.com. And as always, you can follow Brad on Twitter at Brad Powers and the number seven. Brad, appreciate your time as always, man. Thank you so much for joining me. And uh, if we don't talk to you again next week, we'll talk to you again real soon. All right. Sounds good. Take care.